if a teacher is is experiencing all this hardship and all to internalizing all this turmoil, how can they perform optimally in the classroom? They are not presenting as their best, best selves, and that's the problem. We don't understand, again, that if I am the educator in the classroom and I am overwhelmed, I am burned out, I am stressed out, that is what teaching is going to look like. And until we um, rethink how we understand teachers, how we support teachers, how we don't do things that come across as punitive but helpful, you're going to constantly be put in a situation where the educator is not going to present as their, be as their best selves. Mental health and teaching. What is it like to be a teacher in the modern day public school system? And how is it impacting our teachers' lives, their profession, school staff, and the students. I am Robert Asensio. Uh, joining me, as always, is my co-host, retired police chief, military historian, David Magnuson. Hey, David, how are you? Good. How about yourself? Oh, man, I'm good? doing great. Right, good. This is going to be a good show because with us, we have three of our South Florida educators who are professionals. I look at them as yeah. heroines, right? <laughs> Thank you. So, so we have with us, directly next to my to my right, Doctor Ruth Doris Carr. Yes. Okay. We have thing. Nancy Suarez yes. and Karen Kelly. Yes. Welcome, I, ladies. Thank you for thank having you. Thank us. Thank you. So let's get started. Yes. What is it like to be a teacher today? Ooh, what is it like? Well, let's just say more than ever before, I get pulled by classroom teachers to say help. They need as much mental health as our students. And they want therapy, they want counseling, they, want, they need services. The stress of society on top of everything that's going on with possible loss of our union, which nobody wants, is stressful enough, but inflation, the pay rate, everything is going up, but our pay and mm -hmm. respect. So I was reading, um, I was doing a little bit of research before we, we had our discussion, right? And in order to open it up, uh, I looked at the CDC uh, report for 2024 on teaching, mental health and teachers. And what I found interesting was that in 2022 to 2023, there, there was a, there were te a bunch of teachers were surveyed across the country. And 20% of the teachers who were surveyed uh, stated that they have experienced symptoms of depression. And that is 17% more than other industries. And I want to open up the conversation because I want to hear from you guys who are living this. You guys are working with the union also. So you have a broader reach of not just a school site, but across the district. So you have a greater view of what's happening with the teachers. Uh, but let, let's talk about what are the factors that are that teachers are experiencing now. Burnout, right? Yes. The CDC also indicates that they have a concern that burnout amongst teachers will be greater in 2024 than it was prior years. And from 2020 to 2023, it was reported that approximately 300,000 teachers have quit their mm -hmm. teaching positions across the country. Mm -hmm. That's related to burnout, stress, anxiety, depression, and all these factors. Mm -hmm. Ladies, let's get let's start talking. What's going on? So I'll, I'll get us going here. So what is happening is I've been an educator for 24 years. And when I came into the teaching profession, you had mentors. Um, there was a lot of emphasis put on planning, building relationships with your colleagues. Um, to certify was just a matter of continuing to take in-service points. Um, when you say certify, is recertification to be a teacher right, or right. certification to be a teacher? Recertification. Okay. So if you're a teacher, every five years, we have a validity period. 
after that point, you would then have to renew your certificate. So the reason I brought that up is because a lot of teachers are concerned that they're being asked to do more and more and more and more to recertify. And it's a, it's a contentious type of thing because they don't understand if you're making these demands in the classroom and then you're asking us to do more with our certification, which requires their personal tw time quite often, it's just yet another thing for me to be a educator. Now, consider that when we are in need of educators. So why then make it more challenging? So going back to what I was saying a moment ago, in my 24 years as an educator, I am watching the demands get higher and higher, and the pay is getting lower and lower because the economy has changed. So let me let me let me let me point to something that's commonly said through Tallahassee, right? Having heard this not just in the news, but as a member, former member of the House of Representatives, teachers are getting paid more now than they were in the past, but. Are you talking about the cost of living in comparison to what the pay? Exactly. exactly. It's not commensurate. That's exactly. what we need to point exactly. out. Exactly. It is not commensurate. And that is a problem. Now, another thing that is a source of concern is the possibility of not having a voice through our union. Our union has done a lot to ensure through the referendum that teachers are uh, better compensated. So if you have a union that is no longer there, which we're, we're believing that won't happen, but it's concerning for teachers because they say, who is going to look out for us? Yeah. So there is a lot happening that I don't think the general public really understand. And, and here's the thing. Educators are the ones in front of your, your babies every day. They're teaching your students. We always say that the teacher's teaching environment is students' learning environment. So if I present stress, we know that's going to show up. I read, you know, and it said 500,000, but it, it, that's half a million less educators in this country post-pandemic. Half a million. So, Nancy, you were, you were, you were saying oh, that's incredible, though. I'm sorry. The, the, before I even go to the question, yeah. just it blows my mind that we had that many less between 300 and 500,000 yeah. less teachers. Well, we know that everything we our society is dependent on teachers. But Nancy, you had mentioned how you taught um, during the COVID. Correct. How is that? How was the stress for you and how was the stress for the kids? So after t over 20 years of teaching, the year I stayed home, I was home on FMLA myself. Okay. So I didn't go Family to school. Medical leave, leave Act. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was home and I spent the whole year at home. And um, it felt like being a rookie teacher all over again. And I had 20 years under my belt. But it was being brand new all over again. I had to reinvent so much um, every single day. So whatever their counterparts had that had returned to the school building were doing, I had to give that for these children because my students, um, most of them lived in the Brickell area, so they were in high rises. Mm -hmm. They were in apartments. They didn't even socialize with other people. They were home. I was it. So every morning I opened the screen. It was all those twenty-five little cameras, and I was I was it. So. Um, I had to teach, I mean, I, I had first graders, so they're six and seven years old. I had to teach them how to use Zoom correctly. And a lot of the things that we use in our district, they're not user friendly for a six and seven year old, and even less for abuela and abuelo who are helping them at home. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time at the beginning teaching the families, not just the children, on how to use our different areas, how to find the resources that they needed, and it all came, it came down to that I had to I made Amazon wish lists, and I prepared packets or bags of things that they were gonna need, and I did a distribution. I'd drive to Brickell and park in a parking lot, and they'd drive by with their mask, and they'd pick up this stuff that they were gonna need because they were six years old. How were they gonna learn some of the things or experience some of the things if I wasn't doing it that way? And how, who paid for that? So the first few rounds I paid for. You know, she just described Nancy just described. Everything she's doing or she did for these students, which I'm sure that how many other teachers are doing it, but what's the impact to your personal life? That's all time consuming. Right. Mm -hmm. Since I, I mean, it was, I was home and I was home all the time. So um, more than my seven hours and five minutes was dedicated to these students. 
and um, they like to have breakfast with you on on the computer. So before school, I was having breakfast with them as well. So I spent, I'd say about ten hours a day or more, on the computer. You brought normalcy to children. Te teachers brought normalcy back mm -hmm. to the children in in a once in a century time of, of great difficulty. Um, and really, when this was all going on, yes, they talked about fire department, they talked about police, they, but the main number one subject of everything was the schools. How are we going to do it and how are we going to do it right? And So Education Week um, put out some stats, right? And 2024, it is estimated that almost half of the teachers, K through 12, that's kindergarten through 12th grade, experience some level of burnout. One-fifth of school teachers, support staff, meaning the people who support the teachers and non-teachers in the school system, experience stress, but also consider quitting. And approximately 60% of teachers experience job-related stress frequently are always. Can we change the conversation, go a little bit deeper now into how it actually is affecting you guys? I would like to chime in on that because when she was talking about COVID, as a social worker, I mean, her story was Disneyland compared to what we had to go through. Okay. We had to wear the mask, gloves, to go visit kids who were not logging on, who parents has lost jobs, who did not work, who left the country, left these kids alone. Almost made me want to cry just going back there because it was so sad. If people were hungry, kids, it was, it was not. I would drive by the park to see the kids who we couldn't find because, and here they were, and I would say their names and, oh, they'll point them out. He's over there. He's over there. Because everybody was, lack of a better term, hustling trying to help their parents out and doing the things that kids shouldn't have to think about and needing to eat and people taking advantage of students. So it wasn't nice. You know, we were afraid. Here's this big pandemic and we're putting our mask. And even coming back from the pandemic, so much depression. Kids are so sad. All we have staffing, you know, all the time. Baker Act, Baker Act, before they come, Back to the schools, we have to have a mental health team come together to see how we can help. And it was constant. Can you explain Baker. what Baker Act for, is? For how you guys would would Baker Act a child, uh, or call for the Baker or the child to be voluntarily committed to a psychological evaluation? How do you come about, and what the examples of that you were living? Well. We do not transport. We have the um, resource officers for that. So the police officers do the transport. But once we have um, a mental health evaluation and the child does have a plan and is suicidal, two things happen. Depending on the time of the day, the resource officer will either ask the parents to be responsible and take the child to the mental health. And what were the, how were they manifesting their, the threat, the criteria for a person to be involuntarily committed is that they have to either be a threat to someone else or themselves, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yes. I remember one time uh, they were taking this exam and coming right from COVID and the student wrote a letter and they told me, oh, Dr. Dorsky, I want you to talk to this kid. It looks like it's a suicide. We're not sure. You read it. We read it. Well, it turns out it was a homicide plan. He was just planning on how to kill his sister. He was upset. His father had left the country, couldn't find a job. He was an artist. His art was in selling, the art galleries, everything had closed down, and he left the country. He felt like his mom was spending too much time praying in the church, and he felt abandoned. His, his sister was too happy. She had found a job at McDonald's, and she was able to help right after COVID, so he was upset. He had a plan on how he was going to put the radio in the bathtub while she was taking a bath to kill her. So and, can I, I just yeah, wanted to add yeah. what uh, Dr. Dorskar was saying. So you, you kept saying how are teachers affected or impacted. So we are human beings. When you have a situation like that, that we don't just dismiss that. Quite often that goes home with us to our families. When you have scenarios where kids are fighting each other 
or an administrator might be coming down hard on a teacher unnecessarily. We are human beings. We feel those things. And we, again, like I said, we have families. So that creates a dynamic in our families. When we do professional development, um, mindfulness PD or resilient PDs for educators, they are telling us it is a lot right now. The demands are a lot in the classroom and I go home and my family is feeling the impact of the stress that I'm dealing with. There have been times where I've had to talk to an educator out of quitting. Sometimes they just need an opportunity to to get like a mental health day. Let me just be home, gather myself. But again, we make it a point of trying to offer professional development to help teachers understand to put their mask on first mm -hmm. because you're in front of students, right? So you need to know how to prioritize. You need to know how to take a deep breath and <clears throat> gather yourself. So the long and short of it is everything that they're telling you, we are human beings and we carry that stuff with us. But I'll tell you, mm -hmm. in the research too, what I found interesting, there were different levels of they call the burnout. Level one, for instance, passionate but overwhelmed. I think we can all relate to that mm -hmm. in some sense of world, right? Yeah. yeah. Level two, overwhelmed, becoming cynical. That's yeah. the that's the that makes a lot of sense here, and I think we can relate to that as well. Like that. Level three, cynical, approaching exhaustion, and then level four, complete exhaustion mm -hmm. and breakdown. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's I think with the mental health days, with the assistance that's given, you certainly want to stop short of number three, and never get to number four. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. so it's interesting how they how they how they pointed that out and how I would make the assumption that it fits into most high risk or, or high uh, trauma related type of, 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 uh, of jobs, of careers, but none more so probably than teaching. A lot of people focus on stress as, okay, I'm behaved well and my body, I'm taking care of my health. But no, if your mood is affected, it affects everything. You know, you, your, your mood and could affect your in, uh, stress level, anxiety, which stress causes mood change and mood and, and stress and anxiety put together is a vicious cycle where when that occurs, you know, you have you have an overwhelming amount of behavior that, you know, angry for the reasons why you shouldn't. You're, you're upset. You're getting into the class. You're, you're not patient. Kids would come, I would have to put cream of wheat and certain packets and food in my purse because kids come hungry. They don't have food. Mm -hmm. And if I'm stressed and they're stressed, would I care to lend a hand? You don't find that many people who's able to do both. But teachers, they, they, they have food for themselves or barely can eat, and they're thinking about the kids who can't eat. Washing clothes in the classrooms. For for kids who who parents they keep coming to school dirty and they realize parents can't afford soap. They're, they're everything. This is a community. When I write my reports and I ask the parents about their community, once I ask them about their religious community, I always never forget to say, Miami Dade County Public School is a resource community for that family because it, we are. We have to do about everything and look at how the child can learn. Social work says we can't expect the child to learn if they don't have the basic needs. What are the basic needs? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them don't have it. Okay. I used to let them come to my office to do their homework because their electricity was off. So before they go to class, I call the teacher, they're here. Don't tell them about my problem. You know, they get embarrassed. I couldn't even put social work on the past. They didn't want people to know. But we, we're doing everything. Yes. Karen, you mentioned that, that the, the union, the United Teachers Today, mm -hmm. was doing some professional development work and training yes. to help teachers cope. But overall, your teaching industry, I'm asking you maybe to think a little bit broader than Miami-Dade County, okay. across the, the state, let alone the, the country, how are they dealing with all this stress? Because we know we had a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, right? 100-year pandemic. We know the economy went to crap. We know teachers pay. I don't. Need, I would like you to say how much teachers begin to earn on the sal starting salary, how mm -hmm. much they max out at. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's not commensurate with the inflationary cost and of this county. Are they realizing what what they're, they're, they're carrying all this baggage and how they reaching out for help? Yes. 
they are. So I participate with our national affiliate, American Federation of Teachers. We have a group of locals that meet up to have conversation around what can we do to support members. And in those conversations with people from, you know, Iowa or Chicago or anywhere else, we come together and the conversations are very similar. So we take that time to talk to each other about what we're doing. One of our partners that we're working with initially came to us as a result of doing some resiliency work in Chicago. And um, it's called Educator Striving. So what we did was we connected with that organization. We started to make available opportunities for um, for teachers to learn about resilience, priority, and the like. And then as a result of having conversations with those people, when I go to those national meetings, he is now doing work in other locals in other states. So it's not limited to us, of course, but just watching how what he is doing is in demand is a clear indication that it's a problem. So it's more accepting like police work, I guess, right? And, uh, that it, that mental health is an issue that yes. needs to be addressed. Yeah. Mm. Yes. But you know that um, at UTD, at the United Teachers of Date, I have a role where I represent teachers, well, employees of our bargaining unit. And when I go out to the schools, a lot of things are stress-related. A lot of things are, you know, conflict with maybe the principal or it's a, it's a rough neighborhood. The, the parents don't support. And teachers are afraid to talk about their mental health and the principals, the administrators at these schools, they use a resource that the district has called Employee Assistance Program, but they're using it to weaponize. They use it more um, as a punishment, punitive, punitive for, towards the teachers, and the teachers aren't, they're afraid to go there. And then they're afraid that it's going to come back. And it is, I mean, the district has that resource, it's very good. Um, they help, They and it, it extends to your entire family. So there's but, a fear, is that what you're saying, yes. amongst the teaching staff, they the are, teaching community, I should, I should ask? Some teachers are afraid to say things at their school because then the principal will take it as a sign of weakness. The principal will refer them to the employee assistance program, but it's not because the, they feel that the principal wants to help mm -hmm. them. It's really punitive in nature. Um, and we've done, I mean, our insurance, um, I think UTD is the one that negotiated mental health visits don't have a copay for teachers. More teachers should be taking advantage of that. And they don't because of the stigma of it and because they're, it's being weaponized. It's being punitive in nature. Correct me if I'm wrong. If they are speaking up or if they're, if perhaps they're being considered that they're somewhat uh, of a problem, mm -hmm. that that's the way out to send them to EAP? So when we go out to represent our members, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's maybe an allegation from a okay. parent or the principal just believes that that teacher or employee isn't doing their job well. And one of the first things, one of the first steps is to provide them with district resources. And it is those offices, the leave office, uh, Family Medical Leave Act, mm -hmm. the EAP office. Those are the resources they provide. When they're writing up an employee or trying to write up an employee, Almost always, the principal has the employee assistance program referral letter, mm -hmm. and they slide it across the table to the employee. So it does come across as, as punitive and not as helpful as it should be. What is the teacher's so, starting salary? I believe the starting salary now is 50100 Don't quote me, but I okay. think that's the starting and salary. And the maxing out for a teacher? I'm not sure about the max out because we have plans, the referendum, right? right? We have the okay. referendum that attempts to um, provide some additional income to people who were not able to move along the continuum when they took away the steps, when the um, state took away the steps for educators. So teachers love the idea of that because they're able to see extra money in their paycheck. So that alleviates some of their stress. But it's, it's not but if the secret. voters don't pass the referendum exactly. again. Then... We're back to square one. Exactly. And here's the thing. It's a trickle down effect. I speak as a steward. I'm also a steward and um, executive board member of UTD. So when I and been in the system for 17 years. So when I go in to speak to a principal or an administrator about how they're doing something or helping out advocating, they're stressed too. 
we get down to the bottom, they're having issues. The administrators, administrators are people too. People forget, and and they they have their own issues, and they have very a short circuit to deal with, and it's always the ones in the bottom, and the teachers are in the bottom. So they they have a lot of patience. They'll send the principal administrators to the region office for years. They get their time out, and then when everything comes down, they bring them back. Um, teachers. One, two, three, end of the year, you could lose your job. How How is that fair? Do you guys feel that teachers are being scapegoated for politics, political reasons? Oh, yes. yes. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Can you give us some examples? Well, with what is going on right now to say that in order for me to remain in my union, you're not going to let dues automatically come out of my paycheck, even if I consent. That's what you pay for membership. That's what Correct. we pay for that's membership, right. right? And that is not, that's not happening with everyone, but that's help happening with educators in the public sector. Why would someone be concerned with the fact that I want my dues to come directly out of my paycheck? No one has a problem with a gym membership coming out of my paycheck or my subscription to Hulu coming out of my bank account or medical? the gym membership. It, exactly, medical. So to me, that is a uh, deliberate intent to find a way to make this, this process convoluted. And that's problematic. And what I can tell you that I know for certain, without a doubt, Many, many, many of my colleagues are concerned with their contract. Teachers have a contract. If the union were to go away, that contract is null and void. That is problematic. That's why they want to keep their union, because they want to be able to have a voice, and they want to know that there are some parameters around what they can and cannot be asked to do. And with always keeping the child, the consideration of the child first. My colleagues, we are devastated by that, and some are dealing with stress with that issue alone. The idea that I may not have a union, may not have a voice. And then the the state is trying to mandate what I can and cannot teach. They're not seeing me as a professional. That is very stressful. Imagine if you were questioned at every turn, if you were micromanaged. Those are the things that really have teachers um, concerned with right now, losing their contract. And it's definitely problematic. And I wanted to add, I'm sorry. Yeah. We even are divided amongst ourselves. Think about it. I remember going in, this teacher says, oh, you know, um, um, they're accusing us of teaching the wrong things. And I say, but you're a teacher. What did you say? We have a curriculum that the state must approve. They tell you to follow this curriculum. You have to teach this by this time, this by this time. Strict curriculum, but they're telling you that you're grooming kids. They're accusing you of things that really is not happening because of the strict mandated state curriculum and everybody is following. And yet, because you're just going with the flow, are you breaking the rule? If somebody worked at a big corporation and somebody broke the rule, they focus on that one person. They don't ostracize the whole, vilify. Um, vilify the whole teacher's department and say, oh, public schools are no good just for their personal gain. For the audience, anybody who would watch this video, what do you want them to, te to know about teaching in today's environment? What do you, what's your message to them? Go ahead. Well, when I decided to be a teacher, I signed up to teach them all, all of them, exactly how they come, exactly where they're at, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, I teach all of them. And right now, the government is really making it, they're putting too many rules and too many Seeing the speed legislature. bumps, the legislature, um, like even when they don't say gay bill, I teach all of them, every single one of them walks, that walks in the door. I didn't really come into this for the money. I wasn't gonna. I didn't plan on being a millionaire. I came because I love what I do. I love teaching. I love impacting these children's lives. But I signed up to teach all of them, every single one of them. So, last message to the public. We have one and a half minutes, and then no one here. And much like Nancy said, I want the public to know that teachers love teaching and they love their students. They love seeing the bright eyes when students get it, or they love the idea of celebrating with students when they make accomplishments. And those accomplishments are not just reserved to what happens in school. They'll come and tell their teacher, hey, this, is ha this happened at home, and teachers celebrate those things with them. So I think that if the public understands 
that teachers love teaching and they love students. I think that is the starting place for us to come together as a collective community. Because remember, education is the profession on which all others are built, right? So we have to come together with those things in mind. And how can the public help the teachers? Well, wow. how can Quickly. the public help the teachers? Yes. Understanding that the teachers are not just the classroom teachers. So we've got social workers, psychologists, counselors, and understanding that we are community, be volunteers, um, um, provide, join the PTA. If there, any school in your neighborhood that you can provide any type of service to teachers and principals and social workers and psychologists, we, we're welcome to it. Volunteer. We collect the food, we, we collect clothes, we, we've done a lot. May I just say it. this? I know we might be out of time, but thank you for having a show like this, right? You're very welcome. Because you thought enough of educators to say, we need to hear from them. We need to understand what's going on because we understand that they have value mm -hmm. in the community and that they really do God's work. It's yes. important. So we appreciate you for giving us the opportunity to share our stories and to and to let the uh, the public or the community understand what it is that educators have to manage on a daily basis. Yeah. No, David, no, real quick, bit Robert, we we've we've been down this road many times. We want this community support. We we don't like it when we don't get it, and there's times when we don't, and we're riding sky high when we get it. Educators, above all, educators need to be supported. Thank you. They need to be supported. Minimize that stress with the support. It will minimize somewhat um, and give them the tools to succeed. Thank you. Thank well, you. on that note, given that we're given gratitude, I am gracious for and grateful to the Miami Community News team, Grant Miller, Michael Miller, Miami's Community News, Alex Sukis, our producer behind the scenes. Thank you. And you, the public, we cannot thank you enough. Drop us a line. Let us know what your thoughts are. You can find us on all podcast platforms in addition to the Miami Community News Papers and Miami Community News Network. We'll talk to you next time.